Today we continue a sermon series entitled, We Believe That. In these Sundays leading toward Easter, we'll be exploring those core beliefs that all Christians hold in common. We'll be examining those marks of faith for those who profess faith in Jesus from our own vantage point as members of a Christian church, Disciples of Christ congregation. I invite you to continue on this voyage as we discover what we believe about baptism. Let's take a look. To understand what we believe about baptism, we'll first turn to our passage from Acts. There the Ethiopian eunuch exclaims to Philip, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? This story has numerous elements related to baptism. The Spirit, Jesus' death, and the good news. Conversion, and that outsiders are included in God's mercy. We'll say more about these elements in a bit, but for now, let's turn to the preamble to the design, the closest we'll get to a profession of faith. In this document, we hear these words, and please say them with me. Through baptism into Christ, we enter into newness of life and are made one with the whole people of God. The preamble recognizes that baptism is into Christ, and after baptism, we enter into a new mode of living. Our character is to be transformed. Being made one with the whole people of God stresses that we're not baptized into a particular congregation or denomination, but rather into the universal church of all times and places. Baptism is one of the essential practices of the church, and we'll be looking not only at this practice, but also what we believe about it. To better understand where we are now, we'll first look at our founders and what they believed about baptism. Baptism was an important aspect of faith for our founders, and we'll examine what they have to say about it. Alexander Campbell's thinking about baptism was shaped by his own life experiences. As an infant, he'd been baptized by sprinkling in the Presbyterian Church. Before his first child was born, he hadn't paid too much attention to the subject of baptism. With her birth, however, he restudied the New Testament to determine whether he would have her baptized as an infant. Through painstaking biblical research, he came to the following conclusions. Number one, baptism is for penitent believers those capable of understanding and professing their faith in Christ. Two, the word baptismos in Greek has only one meaning, immersion, and this is the only way in which baptism should be administered. Three, baptism is a means of pardon and receiving God's grace. From Campbell's study of the Bible, he concluded that infant sprinkling was unauthorized by Scripture, and therefore he was an unbaptized person. Campbell believed that infant baptism was neither biblical nor effective, so immersing adults who'd been sprinkled as infants wasn't really re-baptism, but their first true baptism. So he, his wife, his father, and mother were shortly thereafter immersed in a creek. His infant daughter, however, was not. Prior to this point, the form of baptism for Campbell had been a matter of opinion, but henceforth it would be a matter of faith. As he said, without previous faith and repentance, baptism can merit nothing. Alexander Campbell is one of our founders who spoke on baptism. However, there was another founder, Barton Stone, who had different ideas about baptism. In contrast to Campbell, who said the form of baptism was a matter of faith, 
not opinion, Stone said, my opinion is that immersion is the only form of baptism. But shall I therefore make my opinion a term of Christian fellowship? Stone took a more tolerant view of such matters, and in the Christian church half of the movement, the pious, pious, unimmersed, were welcomed into church membership. For Stone, rebaptism was not necessary to be part of church, nor was immersion necessary for salvation. Campbell eventually came around to share this conviction, and yes, even admitted that because baptism was God's grace at work, even people sprinkled as infants could be saved. <laughs> Which was a big admission for Campbell. Regardless, however, of the beliefs of Campbell and Stone on baptism, the founder whose evangelistic work put the Christian Church Disciples of Christ on the map was Walter Scott. A former Presbyterian like Stone and Campbell, his missionary work on the American frontier was crucial in the spread of our denomination. Scott believed that Acts 2.38 provided a clearly defined plan of salvation, what he called the five-finger exercise that had at its heart baptism. From Acts 2.38, Scott said you should confess your faith, repent of your sins, be baptized, your sins are forgiven, and receive the Holy Spirit and the gift of eternal life. Scott's plan of salvation was biblical and easily remembered, and his efforts led to thousands upon thousands of baptisms in the new movement. After the death of the founders, however, their flexibility hardened into rigid legalism among their followers. For them, the only issue of importance about baptism was how it was administered. Disregarding the tolerance of stone in welcoming the pious unimmersed, or Campbell's admission that baptized infants could be saved, their followers came to believe that there was no salvation without immersion. Immersion became a prerequisite not only for church membership, but also salvation. These followers believed that if someone had been sprinkled as an infant, they must be immersed to receive God's grace. In the early middle of the 20th century, there were divisive debates among disciples about membership and whether it was to be open to those who had been baptized as children but did not wish to be immersed. Truth be told, both infant and believer's baptism stress different sides of the baptismal formula, which is that baptism is divine grace plus human response. Both ways of baptism have their strengths. Infant baptism shows that God alone is the author of our salvation. That even before we were able to claim God as our own, that God had already claimed us. And that the good news isn't dependent on our ability to receive it. On the other hand, the strength of believer's baptism is that it shows the need for an individual decision of faith, that we publicly profess our allegiance to follow Jesus. The weakness of infant baptism is that it runs the risk of minimizing the individual decision for faith that confirmation provides. The weakness of believer's baptism is that it runs the risk of minimizing the priority of God's grace that it's something we choose to do for God rather than a response to God's initiative. Supporters for believers' baptism cite Acts 2.38, which Walter Scott quoted, Repent and be baptized every one of you, so you may be forgiven and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
supporters of infant baptism, cite Acts 2.39, which says, This promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. They also note that entire households in the book of Acts were baptized, which may have included infants, because when the head of the house converted, so did everyone else in that household. Regardless of how one was baptized, the question of membership and baptism was settled at the 1975 General Assembly of our church, which stated, we confess that all who are baptized into Christ are members of his universal church. For disciples, the normative practice of baptism is by immersion, but by whatever form of baptism we've had, whether being sprinkled as infants or immersed in another church, we are welcomed and accepted fully as members within the Christian church disciples of Christ. By welcoming and recognizing other denominations' baptisms as valid, we were welcomed into the broader ecumenical church. We've surveyed our history as to the practice of baptism. From Campbell, Stone, and Scott, we've inherited a legacy on baptismal practice. Given our history, what do we believe about the meanings of baptism? Having examined our practice of baptism, what does baptism signify? Although our founders spoke at length on the form of baptism, their chief concern was to its function. They weren't as interested in the mode of baptism as its meaning. Campbell said that the meaning of baptism had been overshadowed by discussions about how it's done and to whom it may be administered. For Campbell, the meaning of baptism was its only value. Campbell and Stone called themselves reformers and saw their work as continuing the work that Martin Luther and others began. For Campbell, as for Luther, the chief point about baptism is the grace of God. Campbell called baptism a sort of embodiment of the gospel, a visible sign of God's justification by grace. Justification, being put into right relationship with God, comes about through God's initiative and love. We are not justified by anything we do. No human efforts or works will ever make us right with God. Both founders steadfastly held to the Reformation principles of only by grace, only by faith. Baptism's a gift from God, undeserved and unearned solely by God's grace and faith working in us. Stone said, no good works. No qualifications are previously required. The grace-filled meaning of baptism was more important than its mode. The function of baptism, not its form, was foremost in importance for Campbell and Stone. They reiterated meanings from the Reformation that had come originally from Scripture. Those scriptural meanings of baptism were later agreed upon and published in a landmark document from the World Council of Churches called Baptism, Eucharist, and Ministry. The fruit of more than 50 years of study, reflection, and dialogue among 300 member churches. It recognizes that if Jesus' prayer for unity of the church is to be realized, there must be basic agreement among Christians on baptism, Eucharist, or the Lord's Supper, 
and ministry. Unity of the church is something we disciples are strongly committed to. So the meanings of baptism found in this document are ones we're united with believers around the world in affirming. This document says that although there are multiple images of baptism, there are only five primary meanings of baptism that these 300 denominations affirm as central to scripture and to baptism. The first meaning is participation in Christ's death and resurrection. We heard it in the passage the Ethiopian eunuch was reading. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. In baptism, Christians are immersed in the liberating death of Christ where our sins are buried, where old Adam is crucified with Christ and buried, and where the power of sin is broken. Fully identified with Christ, death, we are buried with him and raised here and now to new life in the power of the resurrection. Confident will also be one with him in a resurrection like his. We are no longer slaves to sin, but free. Second primary meaning of baptism is conversion, pardoning, and cleansing. We heard it in Acts 8.35 where Philip proclaimed to the eunuch the good news about Jesus, and that news changes the eunuch's life forever. Baptism implies confession of faith and conversion of heart. The New Testament underlines the ethical implications of baptism by saying it's a washing of the body with pure water a cleansing of the heart of all sin, and an act of justification, being made right with God. Those who are baptized are pardoned, cleansed, and made holy by Christ, given a new way of living. A third primary meaning of baptism is gift of the Spirit. We heard it in our account of the Ethiopian eunuch where the Spirit said to Philip, Go over to this chariot and join it. The Holy Spirit is at work in the in the lives of people before, in, and after their baptism. God gives all baptized persons the anointing and promise of the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that revealed Jesus as Son during His baptism and empowered the disciples at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit marks the baptized with a seal and implants in our hearts the first installment of our inheritance as daughters and sons of God. The Spirit nurtures the life of faith in our hearts and brings us to completion with God. The fourth primary meaning of baptism is incorporation into the body of Christ. It's a sign of our common discipleship And through it, we're brought into union with Christ, each other, and the church of every time and place. Our common baptism is a sign of our unity in Christ, giving witness to the healing and reconciling love of God. The fifth primary meaning of baptism is sign of the kingdom. It's the story behind the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. Deuteronomy 23.1 forbids eunuchs to be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. Yet in Isaiah 56.4-5, through God promises that there will be a day when eunuchs will be given even a better name than sons and daughters. Philip, by welcoming this outsider and baptizing him, says that that promised day has arrived. Baptism initiates the reality of a new life given in the midst of the present world, one in which ethnic, social, and gender differences are superseded by the unifying love of Jesus. Baptism gives participation in the community of the Holy Spirit It's a sign of the kingdom of God and of the life of the world to come. 
Baptism's power embraces the whole of life, extends to all nations, and anticipates the day when every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Over 300 expressions of the one church are in agreement that the five primary meanings of baptism are participation in Christ's death and resurrection, conversion, pardoning, and cleansing, gift of the Spirit, incorporation into the body of Christ, and sign of the kingdom. Campbell believed that the only value of baptism was in its meaning and would be encouraged that the church worldwide has come to an agreement on those meanings based on Scripture. For our founders, the most important thing about baptism was not how it's done, but what it means. Meaning is the most important thing, not the mode by which it's done. Baptism embodies the gospel, giving a visible sign of God's love, forgiveness, and new life. Thanks be to God for Jesus and his baptism that makes us God's own. Amen.